going to start talking about attitudes. And my, the title of my message today is The Blessings of a Positive Attitude. You know, attitude is very important. We know that sometimes we're talking to someone and they don't like what we're saying and they do a, a facial expression or they say something and we say, why are you showing me attitude? So we use this word attitude in a different way as it was used 10 or 20 years ago. So I like really to see attitude from a biblical perspective, not from a social perspective, not from the, the, the way uh, the world perceives what is attitude, but from a biblical perspective. And the Word of God has a lot of things to say about attitude. Uh, so I, I want to start by reading a verse in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And the Bible says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there by any virtue, if there, if there be any praise, think on these things. Okay, so this is not just a word of advice. When I read the Word of God, I understand that God knows what is best for me. So in what regards to attitude? Attitudes are manifestations of things that go uh, uh, deep inside our heart and they, they become uh, real to others as we do actions and as we speak to others. So we can have either a good and positive attitude or we can have a bad and negative attitude. Now, attitudes are a reflection of our heart. So, if in your heart you start a lot of bad things, eventually bad attitudes will transpire, will come out. If in your heart you store good things and positive things, and things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, a good report, things that bring virtue and praise, if you think about these things, your attitude will change. Now, before we go any further, I would like to do some uh, preliminary questions and those you don't need to, to answer uh, to anyone just answer to God as you listen to this question first one do you spend more time thinking in good things or negative things? when I say negative things let me say if you don't have enough money to pay your bills a lot of negative thoughts can come and you start thinking I'm not going to be able to do these things. I'm not going to be able to, to give to the church. I'm not going to be able uh, to do this thing that I wanted to do. So if you occupy your mind just thinking of what you cannot do, you're thinking in negative things. On, the, on the, the other side, even if you don't have enough money, but you have an attitude of faith, and you say, I believe and I trust that God will provide, that He will supply for all of my needs. Now, you have the same situation, but you're seeing in a different perspective. Now, the question also, are you willing or open to be changed, to be transformed? Because God wants to change us in order to give us a life of blessing. And asking this, how valuable is the Bible for you? Do you really value what the Bible says? When the Bible says, you no, know, think in the, in the, about things that are honest, true, pure, pure, all these things. Do you really value the Bible? Or do you think it's just another book on the shelf? It's something that you learn about on Sundays, but then you go with your everyday life and you just forget about what you've learned. Another question is, are you willing to change your attitude? Or do you think you're already perfect? I'm not perfect. I know when I got married, I thought my wife was perfect and she thought I was perfect. And, you know, when we're dating and we're, uh, we're engaged, we think the other person is so perfect. And then we, we start to find all the issues and faults and problems and character issues and uh, attitudes and all these things. So none of us are perfect. We're all guilty of having bad attitudes. So no one here is immune. We all have, eventually, bad attitudes. The question is, are we willing to change and to be transformed to the image of Jesus? A Christian is a person that is Christ-like. So we need to reflect the characters and attitudes of Jesus. 
And my last question, can you try to look at yourself, at least for these 20 minutes that we're going to spend here together, or are you willing just to see and find fault in other people? You know, this uh, problem of finding faults, it's rooted in our society. It's so deeply rooted that the, the shows with greater audience on TV are the ones where you have three judges, and some have to be from Great Britain. <laughs> and these judges have to uh, uh, score people for, what, for their achievements, and they judge them. And sometimes they can be mean, nasty, rude, especially if you watch those, uh, uh, those um, uh, culinary shows like uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 and we, we have uh, here some experts in, the, in cuisine, but if you see those shows on the, on the Food Network, you see people are rude and nasty, they mistreat others, they have all sorts of bad attitudes, and now it's even glorified to have bad attitudes. When you see standing comedians, the more they curse, the more people laugh. And sometimes it's not funny, but they just say a bad word and people laugh. Why? Because they, we live in a society that glorifies bad attitudes. So, the question is, why should we as Christians change our attitude? And the uh, simple answer is this. When you have bad attitudes, you end up in a place called wilderness. Now, imagine that you're on your way to work tomorrow, and as you're going on your way to work, you will find on the highway, a sign, and on the sign you'll see this beautiful image. Maybe from there it's, you think it's, it's, uh, it's just the ocean. No, this is the desert. And this is an image of the Sahara Desert. And imagine that they're announcing that you can do your next vacation in the Sahara Desert. It's kind of sandals, but just with the sandals. <laughs> So, excuse me, if you see an image of a desert, and maybe a scorpion or something, or a snake in the desert, will you want to do your vacation there? I don't think so. Wilderness, the desert, is a place that we try to avoid. It's not a pleasant place. I know it can be beautiful, but it's not a place of rest. It's not where you're going to spend your next vacation. Now the Bible talks about wilderness in the book of Numbers and on chapter 13. Uh, it says that the people of God went from Egypt to the promised land and they decided to send 12 spies to check out the land. So th their task was very simple. They crossed a portion of the desert, about 3 million people. They arrived to the borders of the promised land and by, by God's instruction, they crossed to see what was there. And it was beautiful. They really loved it. They, they saw the land. The fruit was amazing. The vegetables were huge. Everything was wonderful. But when they returned from the twelve, ten said, It's beautiful, but it's not for us. Because there's giants in the land. And other two, Joe, Joshua and Caleb, they said, it's our land, we love it, let's go ahead, let's possess it, and the giants, they're just our bread, they're just uh, preparing things for us. God gave us this land. As a consequence of what happened, the Bible says that the ten influenced the people, and because of their attitude, their negative attitude, they had to spend in the desert a period of 40 long years, one for each day they spent in the promised land. So they went for 40 days, they vacationed for 40 days in that place, and they forgot that their final destination was uh, that land, that land was theirs, and they started just their attitude was another attitude of doubt. They said, I doubt we can conquer this land. They're too big for us. They're going to destroy us. In their eyes, we're like grasshoppers. We're like bugs. We're nothing. And because of their negative attitude, they ended up in the wilderness. Now, this bad pattern is seen through the Word of God. That whenever someone 
has an attitude which is an attitude of doubt, they will end up in a spiritual wilderness. I don't know if you're there right now. How do we know we're in a spiritual wilderness? It's when we feel dry inside. It's when you come to church and the Word of God doesn't say anything to you. It's when you come to church and you start to think about, should I continue to go? I went there, I didn't receive a thing. Well, maybe it's because of the preacher. So let me change to another church. And they go to another church and the problem continues. And they go to another church and the problem is still there. And they end up, stop going to church because they're in the spiritual wilderness and there's no way out. Then because of attitude. So, I, I want just to, that you to consider the, the importance of attitudes. And we need to have a, a, a sight of our final destination. I just came back today from my vacation, and many of you, uh, I, I, I was in the log, and you asked me, how was the trip? How was the trip? How was your trip? Some asked me, how was your vacation? That's great. Because the trip really doesn't matter. The trip we can have, you know, I was supposed to travel today and I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> I'm glad I, I changed my vacation one week uh, before because my trip would be awful with this uh, storm <laughs> hitting New York and I had to cross, you know, all the way I had to follow the storm to arrive here. So I'm just glad it didn't happen. But the trip really doesn't matter at all. But very often people focus on the trip. How was the trip? How was your drive? How was your flight? How was this? And, and it really doesn't matter. What matters is the destination. See, we're in a journey to a place called heaven. And right now, you're in the trip. But we cannot lose from sight that God has for us, for each one of us, a mansion, a place prepared in, in, a, in a place we cannot understand fully, which is called heaven. And I want to be there. That's my final destination. It's to be forever with my Savior. It's to be forever with my God. He's a loving God. And He's preparing this place, an amazing place for us. Right now, we're on the road trip to heaven. But if our attitude is not good enough, we'll never get there. We will give up of the trip, of the journey. Jesus said that the roadway to heaven is narrow. And at the end, there's a narrow gate. But when you, you pass the gate, you see this open space, a wonderful place called heaven. And this place is prepared for those that arrive in victory. Victory means that we'll have fights, we'll have struggles, we'll have many things happening to us while we're here on earth in our journey. But I have good news for you. Jesus Christ, by His Holy Spirit, is always present. And He will help us to change our attitude, to have an attitude of victory, not an attitude of defeat. How will we, we do this? You know, about the people, the spies, they, they came and they talked to the people all these bad things, they were leaders, and the Bible says that the people murmured. Now, this is not a word that we use commonly in, in, in our everyday life. It's a, a biblical word, but murmuring means basically gossip. They were gossiping, they were criticizing, they were murmuring, they were saying, how come Moses took us out of Egypt to die here in the desert? Why are we here? And they started to murmur. And because they murmured, the consequence was 40 years in the wilderness. Now, let me tell you that God's principles are the same. God is the same. He doesn't change. We change. He doesn't need to change because He's perfect. And the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So biblical principles from 2,000 years ago are exactly the same today. A consequence of a lifestyle of murmuring, it's spiritual wilderness. And when there's spiritual wilderness, people can still proclaim that they're God's children, they still proclaim that Jesus Christ is their Savior. They still proclaim their faith, but their spiritual life and sometimes natural life, it's running around in circles. If you're running around in circles, now is the time to break that cycle. 
Now is the time to make the decision in your heart. And tell not me, not your friends, but tell God, God, change me, change my attitude, change my life. I want to enter the promised land. I want to arrive at the place you prepared for me. I don't want to, to be stuck here in the desert. I want to move to the place of blessing. So change me, Lord. This is something that I do on a regular basis. I'm not preaching something that I don't do. Because I know that sometimes, during our lifetime, we feel lost. We feel dry. We feel that there's nowhere, nowhere to go. And this is many times a consequence of a life, a lifestyle of murmuring. Now, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, it's there 12 Corinthians, but it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, uh, uh, verses 1 to 3. He's talking about what happened to the Israelites in the desert. He's talking about this, uh, in these events, and he tells in the Bible, these things happen as an example for us. So they had to leave these things in the natural, so we'll understand that if we have a bad attitude, an attitude of murmuring, an attitude of complaining, not giving, not opening our ears for our spiritual leadership, what will happen is eventually we'll end up in the wilderness. Now, the good thing is that after one generation, they finally enter the promised land. So God, God's plans and God's purposes will always be achieved. However, we'll, we'll be, it will be much better that we enter the promised land rather than running in circles, not knowing what's coming next. Dryness in our lives. That's not the plan of God. Now let me go to the conclusion of the message. There's a term in computing, which is a word. The word is wheezy week. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard this word, wheezy week. Wheezy week means just this, what you see is what you get. And this is a very famous word, because I don't know if you're old enough to remember when computers uh, uh, just started to, uh, to be on shelves. I bought a computer and I had a beautiful black and white screen, actually it was green and black screen, and I could uh, write uh, lines of code, but at, it was amazing. I could play games and things, but everything was green and black. And finally, uh, a group of, of uh, researchers, they finally, they created a text editor and things, and they called it WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. And it was something amazing, because now you were looking at the screen of the computer, and whatever you produce on the screen, you could print on a, 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 a sheet of paper, and it actually printed what you see, what you were seeing on the computer. I don't know if you, it happened to you, you print something, and then the computer prints gibberish, something different. <laughs> it ever happened to you? And instead of, of one page, it's printing 30 pages with all sorts of aspects and things. Did it ever happen to you? <laughs> so this is not wheezy week. Wheezy week is what you see, is what you get. Why am I telling you this? Because in our lives, we all have, we all have an interior image of ourselves. And let me tell you, the image that you have, what you see, is what you get. There's two Bible verses that I would like to read to you. Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are found the issues, or the fountains of life. So it says, keep your heart, because out of your heart, there's a fountain, there's issues of life. And another verse says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. So uh, as you think in your heart, this is what you will become. What you see inside is what you get on the outside. If you see yourself as living in defeat, in misery, if you see yourself like a grasshopper, that's what you become. If you think you're like a bug, you'll become a bug. <laughs> that's as easy as this. This is why uh, people sometimes pay loads of money just to go and, and to listen to motivational speakers. And just by motivating themselves, they're able to achieve great things, even without having God in their lives. This is a principle for human life. If you're motivated on the inside, eventually you will achieve victory. 
That's, that's why when you see a fight, uh, whether it's boxing or any, any kind of fight, and they're interviewing the fighters just before they have the clash, they're, they're saying, I'm going to win, I'm going to, 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 to bite his ear, I'm going to do whatever, you know? And they pronounce all sorts of things. Why? Because they're motivating themselves. They know that if they arrive to the press with doubts, with all sorts of things, that's what they will get. In sports, uh, they, they usually hire people to motivate others, to tell them, yes, you can win. Let's go, let's go to the field. Come on, guys, we're going to win this game. People need to be motivated. And listen, when you come to church, this should be a place where you're motivated. But how can you leave the church motivated if you receive the Word of God and you confess and you apply the Word of God into your life? Then you will have what you see on the inside being manifested on the outside. Now the question is, what are you speaking? What does your mouth speak in abundance? I heard this story of a lady that went to a gas station and as she entered the town, the attendant was filling up the tank and she told the man, listen, I, I came here to town and I intend to move here and I want to ask you how, how are people here in this town? And as he was filling the tank, he told the lady, well, how are people in the town where you came from? And she told all oh, people were really mean, always gossiping inconsiderate, uh, really uh, people with no character, really mean people, awful people, they're horrible. And the gas attendant told her, well, I, I regret to tell you, but it's pretty much what you're going to find here in this city. <laughs> so she then paid the man, went, went away on the car, and not long after, another car arrived at the gas station, and another lady told exactly the same thing to the attendant. Listen, I'm moving to this town. And uh, I just want to know how are people here. And he, he told the same thing. Well, how are people from your hometown? And she told, oh, people are awesome. They were lovely, kind, always caring. Uh, people were, 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 were always doing good, good, good stuff. Uh, you know, good things to, to everybody. It was a lovely place. And the man told her, you know what? going to find the same kind of people in this town. <laughs> what is the lesson from, uh, from this small story? What you see is what you get. And you will attract people of the same kind as you are. And if you think, well, I'm just surrounded with people that gossip, with people that are mean, maybe it's time for a change, maybe it's time for you to cut some friendships, maybe it's time to get friends with God and spend more time with God than with those friends that are always gossiping. Isn't that a good idea? Yes. Jeremiah 13, 23, it says, Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin or the leopard in spots? Nor can you do good if you are doing, if you are accustomed to, to doing evil. Now, a leopard cannot change his spots. Now, the color of the skin, we know that Michael Jackson did it but he had a bad ending. So the, the question of the Bible is not about skin color, it's about change. A leper cannot change its spot. I know you can use uh, some paint and paint the leper, but the leper uh, itself cannot change the spots. We cannot change our exterior. But this is just an illustration to say this. If you are accustomed to bad attitudes, you cannot change. And if you cannot change, let me tell you, God can change you. Amen? We need an exterior intervention in our lives in order to change that. Now, let me take you to grade one and then we'll, we're, we're going to finish. Grade one of this teaching was given by Jesus. So this is the basic teaching about attitudes. He was telling uh, about the goodness of God and he was being criticized by the Pharisees. So as the Pharisees were criticizing him for healing people, for doing good things, in Matthew 12, 33, Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, so we see the tree and the fruit, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. The tree 
and the fruit. For the tree by its fruit. So he's talking now about tree, trees as an example. Now it's not a leopard, now it's not the color of our skin, now it's a tree. And you can have a good tree or a bad tree. How do you know if the tree is good? It's not by what you see, but it's by what you taste. Correct? The oranges can look great and then you try the orange and it's sour, it's worse than a lemon. So you know the quality of the tree by the quality of the fruit. And then he was very nice to, to, the, to, the, to the audience. He was preaching and he said, you brought up vipers. Wow. <laughs> Don't use this in church. <laughs> How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, good person, of his good treasure, good treasure, brings forth good. Does that make sense? Okay. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So now it's not trees. Now he's talking about persons. And he's talking about a treasure. And then he says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So what is the abundance of your heart? Jesus said we have a treasure inside of our heart and this treasure which is our heart can be filled with good things or with bad things so whatever you fill in you will bring out does that make sense so if you fill your heart with bad things eventually you have a bad end bad fruit bad attitudes but if you feel if you fill your heart with good things doesn't matter the circumstances you have a positive attitude and if you have a positive attitude, that pleases God. And when God is pleased, you are blessed. The blessings of a positive attitude. Does this make sense to you? Oh, okay, so how can we put good things in our heart? It's not just a matter of coming to church. Because you can come to church and fill your heart with bad things. I've seen it over and over and over again. I've seen people that come to church, you go to their, to their neighbors, to their family, and they will all tell you, what a horrible person, what a nasty man, what a terrible woman, always gossiping, always criticizing, and always coming with the Word of God to say, uh, to talk about the Bible. I hate this person. So this is, this is common language. The people around the church that will look to people that come to church, but they're manifesting a bad fruit. The Apostle Paul talked about this in terms of perfume, and he said, he said we are a perfume to others. Either a good, a, good, a good sense to the ones that are saved, or a bad smell to the ones that are lost. So, we can manifest good, but do the smell or bad smell. Alright, so are we learning something? Yes. So, what do we need to put in our heart? We need to have an abundance of good things. And this, is, this doesn't happen just by listening to the Word of God, but we need to receive it and put it on the treasure. Not everything that comes into my house goes to my treasure. A lot of things go to the garbage. In fact, I put a load of two bags or three bags of garbage, big ones, every week on, outside the house. Do you produce that many garbage? Maybe you produce just a bag, I don't know. But probably, when you put all that garbage out, you're wondering, how did I accumulate so much garbage? When you move to another house, then you'll see the garbage. <laughs> because we accumulate a lot of garbage, a lot of things that we don't use. But those things are not on the precious part of the house. Now, in our lives, we receive a lot of things. You can receive the Word of God and trash it. You can receive a teaching and put it aside. But you can receive something and you can be sitting down here today receiving the Word of God and saying, this is precious. I'm going to keep it in my heart. Truly, I need to change my attitudes. Yes, I've been negative in many things, but now I'm determined to change. Hello, are you here? So, let me take you now to grade 12. Actions corresponding to your words. It's not enough to know the Word of God. You need to live the Word of God. It's not enough to know that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You need to manifest 
through your actions that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So we listened to grade one. Now let's go to grade 12 and next week we go to university. Okay? Is that fine with you? So grade 12, John 21, verse 15. They went fishing and they went and finished breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, son of John, John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. What is the question? Do you love me? Do you love me? Now, notice, now Jesus Christ is already resurrected. So now they're not, they're, they're born again, they're spirit-filled, born again Christians that are there. They went fishing. And Jesus is asking, do you love me? And the words are there, yes, I love you. And now he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. He was, you know what, what, what this word grief means? He was offended. He was offended with Jesus. He wasn't just grieved. He was deeply offended with Jesus. You know you can be offended with God? You know you can come also to church and the pastor can offend you? You know you can sit down in church and be offended by people around you? And sometimes this is the way that God has to reach into your heart. Many times it's through an offense. And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, you love me. And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So what was the answer after, after, uh, after he said, yes, I love you? What was the requirement? Feed? Feed my sheep. Action. Something practical. Feed my sheep. You can say, oh, but I love the Lord and I love coming to church, but I do not have time to do anything at the church. God bless you. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you really love Jesus? Yes. If you don't do anything for Him, let me tell you, you're missing the point. You're truly missing the point. You know, we have some teachers downstairs teaching Sunday school. You know what they're doing? They're feeding the sheep. The little ones. You know, we have the garage sale here and we have share every Saturday at the church giving food away. You know what we're doing? Feeding the sheep. You know, when you arrive, the, the doors were open, people were greeting you at the door, people were giving you, uh, you know, the newsletter, people were, you came here, people were worshiping. You know what we're doing? Feeding the sheep. Let me tell you, if you're not doing anything at all in terms of feeding the sheep, you're missing the point. Do you really love Jesus? You know, I once heard that when people come to church on, the, on a Sunday morning, they love God. If they come to church Sunday morning and sub, Sunday evening, they really committed to do something to the Lord. But when they come, and they come Sunday morning, Sunday evening, they go to a small group, or they come to another activity, those are the ones that love the church. See, loving God has a component of service. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Of course, when we're feeding people that come from the outside, they're not necessarily God's sheep. But we treat them then like they were. It's an act of faith. So, grade 12 of this teaching about it, it's this. You should be doing something to serve the Lord. Anything. Something. And if you don't know what to do, this is why you have pastors. Pastors are here to encourage you and to point the way. We're not here just to preach on Sunday. We're here to tell you how to feed the sheep. Does this make sense? Let's go to our conclusion. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if 
there by any virtue and by any praise think on these things. So this is our verse for today. And the practical way you can apply this verse is to discipline yourself to think about positive things. It seems to be very simple. But the lesson here is whatever you put in your treasure will come out. The evil man out of the evil treasure speaks bad things. But also, you can speak good things. You can say, oh yes, I love the Lord. And then the pastor tells you, can you do this please at the church? I don't have time. Uh, can you do this at the church? Well, at this point of my life, you know, I need to decide some things, so ask me in six months. So what about during six months? Are the sheep starving during six months? <laughs> What are we going to do? Now, the reason why we do amazing things, like uh, kids in the park, like uh, play for all these things that this church is doing, is because there are people here that are committed to feed the sheep. If you're one of them, praise God. If you're not doing anything for God, anything at all, and if you always give excuses, listen, when the pastor asks you, you know, can you please do this? If you don't have time, that's it. You don't have time. But if you can squeeze a little bit of time, half an hour or something, during a week, a week has a lot of hours, if you can have half an hour where you can do something for God, well, just do it because it's a privilege. It's through that privilege that you show God that you love Him. It's not through your lip service. It's not by saying, yes, God, I love you. But you need to do something very practical. Let us all stand. And uh, Psalm 95 verse 7 says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. I'm going to ask the present worship team to come up. We're going to have a time of worship, a time of praise. But this is the moment of the service where I would like to call you to action.